Overlord Volume 5 Chapter 1 A Young Man's Heart Part 1 Lower Fire Month, Ninth Month, Second Day, 2330 The man lit the lantern that hung at his waist. It used a special oil for fuel, which produced a green flame, and it gave off a creepy-looking light, which illuminated the surroundings. He stepped outside and felt as though he were walking into a wall of heat. A look of distaste crossed the man's face, but the season had always been hot to begin with, and nothing could be done about it. Around this period, every place in the kingdom was still muggy and unpleasant, even after sunset. That said, the time of harsh heat was gone, and the temperature ought to go down as time went by. Still, there was no sign that it was changing for the cooler. Ah, today was hot too. Yeah. I heard that it's cooler up north, near the ocean, the man grumbled. His partner for tonight replied, if only there were some rain. That would take the edge off the heat. He looked to the sky as he said that. The sky was clear, there were no clouds in the sky, to say nothing of rain clouds. The constellations seemed abnormally large, but it was simply the usual night sky. Yeah, some rain would be good. All right, time to work. It would not be quite right to describe these men as ordinary villagers. For starters, they were armed. They wore leather armor and had long swords at their waist, far too militarized for ordinary village guards. In addition, their faces and bodies did not look like those of farmers, but hinted at a familiarity with violence. The two of them walked into the village without a sound. Shrouded in night, the village was silent save for their footsteps. They pressed forward steadily amidst this sinister atmosphere, as though nothing else lived here. Their calm attitudes suggested that patrols like these were daily business for them. The village they walked in was surrounded by a high wall, and there were six watchtowers within sight. They looked sturdy and well-built, even frontier villages, which were frequently attacked by monsters would not boast such formidable watchtowers. This was not so much a village as a military base. Even so, a third party might only consider this to be a heavily fortified village. However, what that observer saw next would truly furrow their brow. Under normal circumstances, most people would only encircle residences and storehouses when building a wall and leave the crop fields outside. That was because a wall that was big enough to include the fields would be a ruinous investment of time and money. However, this village had done precisely that, gathering the green fields of crops which swayed in the night wind into its walls, within the village. It was as though said crops were gold bullion which had to be hoarded. The men walking through this strange village felt someone looking at them from a watchtower. The fact was that there were bow-armed men on the towers. All he needed to do was raise his lantern high in case of an emergency, and his friends would come to his aid. That said, when he thought about his colleagues' skills, the man was not very excited about having them support him with arrow shots. However, he was greatly reassured by the fact that his friends could wake all their comrades by ringing the alarm bell. His colleagues, who were sleeping between shifts, would give him an earful if he raised his lantern by mistake. However, the man was determined to wave it at the merest sign that something was wrong. He did not wish to lose his life over a small matter. That said, he did not actually think anything bad would happen. They had been performing the same patrols for several months, and he imagined that these patrols would carry on forever. As he considered his future with distaste, the man continued his slow walk through the village down his fixed route. Halfway through his patrol, a serpentine object suddenly wrapped itself around the man's neck. No, that was not a snake. The object that wrapped itself around his mouth, and did not let go was an octopus tentacle. Right after it lifted the man's chin, searing pain blossomed over his exposed throat. This sequence of actions took less than a second. A gurgling sound, like that of drinking, came from his throat. That was the last sound the man would ever hear in his life. The hand holding his mouth let go, supporting him from behind so he would not slump to the ground. After verifying that the man had been thoroughly exsanguinated, his assailant pulled out the vampire blade, the weapon which had killed him. The being holding the man upright was a figure in black. Its entire body was obscured in jet black clothing save its eyes. Said clothing was made of cloth, 
with gauntlets and other pieces of armor to improve defensive ability. A metal plate covered its chest, but it bulged visibly, giving it the shape of a pair of feminine breasts. Another similarly dressed figure emerged from behind the other man's back. Much like her partner, she wore a metal breastplate. The first looked to the second and nodded. She scanned her surroundings after verifying the silent death of her victim. It would seem nobody had noticed this. Somewhere in the corner of her heart, she breathed a sigh of relief. The lanterns illuminated them, but the observers from the platform above should not be able to see them, given that they were pressed tightly against the two men. All they had to worry about was that they might be spotted in the instant of their shadow step, a short-range teleportation from one shadow to another, but that worry was a thing of the past now. She paid no attention to the dagger, whose bright red hue had become even more vibrant after draining blood and propped up the man's body before it could collapse. From the observation platform above, it looked like the two patrolling men had stopped in their tracks. However, if they kept the two men standing still or let them slump to the ground, someone would be suspicious. Something had to be done right away. However, that was not their job. Suddenly, the woman felt the man's limp body lurch under her hands, as though someone had driven a stake into it. In the next moment, she knew she had not been mistaken. The man lurched into stiff motion. The man was still moving despite being clearly dead, but the woman was not alarmed. Everything was proceeding as planned. She let go and at the same time activated a skill. This was a ninja technique she had learned, called Shadow Meld. With this ability, she could fuse seamlessly with any shadow and become invisible to the naked eye. The two of them blended into the men's shadows, and the men stepped forward, like they had been suddenly unshackled. The pause and then the way they walked their original patrol route looked like they had suddenly remembered what they had to do. However, they moved slowly and clumsily. Their wounds had not been healed, but they did not leak blood either. That was because said blood had been completely drained from their bodies. The two men had become zombies, obediently following the will of their creator. There was no other explanation for how they could still move in that state. The women were not the zombies' creator. To an average observer, there were only two men here. Even if one saw through the women's camouflage, there would only appear to be four people here. However, there was a fifth person present. This fifth person was the creator of the zombies. Their eyes could not see anything, but one of the ninja skills they had learned allowed them to detect the presence of those who were concealed by magic or some other skills, and one such entity stood before them. The preparations here are complete. Perfect. She spoke quietly and received a similarly hushed reply. M.M., got it, I saw it all. I'll be heading to the next location. I need to catch someone who's sufficiently important. Another female voice. However, hers was higher pitched, giving the impression of a tender maiden. We're going to begin our assault too. How about the other two? Are they slacking off because they can't contribute? As if. They're hiding near the village, and they've set themselves up. In an emergency, they'll launch a frontal assault coordinated with you for a pincer attack. All right, I'll be heading towards priority one. Stick to the plan, you two. Their concealed companion floated gracefully, at least, they got that impression, into the sky. It seemed consistent with the movement granted by the fly spell. The presence drew further away, until she vanished into the building she had designated as priority one. This was one of the structures within the village, and a key point which had to be taken. In truth, other buildings should have had higher priority, but this place took precedence over the others once the problem of the message spell came into play. Many people regarded that form of magical communication as unreliable, and so it was rarely used. However, there were others who did not think of it in that way, and made use of it. For instance, there was the Empire, and its cadre of nationally trained magic casters, a certain number of important traders who valued the quick reception of information, and then the enemies who controlled this village. Therefore, their top priority was to apprehend the communications personnel within the building. Since their colleague was already on their way, they had to hide themselves near their objective as quickly as possible. 
This was because they had to act simultaneously and launch their attack before the enemy discovered their presence. The two ninjas exhaled suddenly and ran. Normal people would not be able to follow the way they flitted from dark corner to dark corner. On top of that, when they used the magic items they had on them, even high-leveled adventurers would have a very hard time spotting them. In other words, nobody in the village could detect them. One of them flashed a series of hand signals to her companion as they ran. Though it was merely a series of finger-bending movements, the meaning was immediately clear. We're lucky they didn't have dogs. Came the reply, agreed. This was sign language, of a kind commonly used by assassins. To consummate professionals like themselves, these hand signals were as quick as regular speech. They had also taught their companions the language, but said colleagues had only learned how to make simple gestures and basic secret signals. In contrast, the pair of them had a wide enough vocabulary and sufficient signing speed to use that sign language for everyday speech, and they frequently passed secret messages to each other in that way. Good point. Things are much easier without dogs being drawn by the scent of blood. If the patrollers had brought dogs with them, the assassinations would not have been so easy. While they had ways to deal with dogs, it was better to not have to deal with troublesome things. After her response, her companion rapidly signaled, then, I'll head for my designated building. She replied, got it, and then her companion peeled away and to the side. This left her to run by herself. She glanced aside to the fields. Those fields did not grow wheat, grains or green vegetables. The plants there were the raw ingredient for a forbidden drug whose spread was on the rise throughout the kingdom, called black powder. There were many such fields within the walls of this village, and they all grew the same crop. This proved that this village was a center of drug cultivation. The drug known as black powder was also known as Layla powder. It was a black, powdery substance that was dissolved into water and drunk. This drug was easy to mass-produce, cheap, and gave its users an easily accessible high and sense of intoxication. Thus, it was one of the most famous drugs in the kingdom. While it was toxic in addition to the above-mentioned effects, its users often believed that it had no side effects, and so it was widely abused. She snorted as she thought about the black powder's side effects. All drugs had side effects. I can quit any time I want to was the stuff of a madman's ravings. After dissecting the corpses of black powder addicts, they found that their brains had shrunk to four-fifths the size of a normal person's. Black powder, made from a concoction of wild plants, was originally a powerful poison. Who would believe that such a toxic plant was not poisonous? The black powder which was ubiquitous on the streets was a narcotic that was made from a cultivar of the original plant, which had reduced potency. Even so, the black powder was still very poisonous, and it would only be eliminated from the body after a very long time had passed. As a result, many abusers who stopped using the drug often dosed themselves again, before it had completely left the body. As a result, after reaching a certain stage of addiction, it was nearly impossible for users to quit the habit cold turkey, unless the priests used their magic to forcibly purge their system of the drug. The most troublesome part about drugs like these were their subtle signs of addiction. Even users on a bad trip did not show signs of physical violence and harm others. Thus, the higher UPS in the kingdom did not understand the danger of black powder, and it had practically received their silent approval. It was little wonder that the empire had submitted formal complaints on the matter, on the suspicion that the kingdom was running an underground industry in the production of black powder. While she had still been an assassin, she had used black powder on occasions, and her organization had grown the plants needed to make it. As a result, she was not personally opposed to the substance. Drugs like that could be put to efficacious use if applied properly. The fact was that it was simply a dangerous medicinal herb. However, she had been hired for this job, and her personal opinion had no say in it. Still, requests that don't go through the Adventurer's Guild are a little dangerous. She was not entirely comfortable with this request. She frowned under the cloth covering her face. The requester for this job was a friend of her team's leader. While she had been reassured that the other party would remunerate them appropriately, 
not going through the guild might cause problems. That was true even if they were one of the two adamantite-ranked adventurer parties in the kingdom. H.M., isn't it three of them now? As she thought about the newest adamantite-ranked adventurer team, she arrived at the building designated No. 2. Her task was to recover all the intelligence within this building, and then to set the fields on fire. The thick smoke emitted by the burning drugs was poisonous, but it had to be done to complete the mission. It was quite possible that the wind might carry the smoke in a direction that would harm the villagers, but they did not have the time or the ability to evacuate the villagers. Sacrifices must be made. With those words to herself, she cast all thoughts of the villagers' safety out of her mind. She had been trained as an assassin from childhood, and death rarely troubled her heart. In particular, she was unmoved by the sad fates of strangers, regardless of what tragedies befell them. The only thing she disliked was the look on her leader's face whenever someone had to be sacrificed. However, she had obtained her leader's approval while drawing up this plan, so the thought of saving others did not even cross her mind. More importantly, after the attack here was completed, she would need to use teleportation magic to move to another village and burn it down as well. That plan occupied her mind and consumed all her efforts. This was not the only site which grew the raw materials for drugs. According to their research, there were ten large-scale plantations within the kingdom, and those might not even be all of them. Otherwise, they would not be able to sustain the massive quantities of drugs being trafficked throughout the kingdom. All we can do is pull up the weeds where we find them, it's tiring, but there's no other way. Ideally, they would be able to find written orders within this village, but that was not likely. All they could do was hope that this village's supervisor, or equivalent, had information of similar importance. Leader would be happy if we could find some traces of the organization's involvement in this. The criminal organization which grew these drugs was known as Eight Fingers. The name came from the eight-fingered god of thieves who was a vassal of the earth god. It was a vast criminal syndicate that dominated the kingdom's underworld. This organization was divided into eight divisions, responsible for the slave trade, assassination, smuggling, burglary, drug trafficking, security, finance and gambling. These eight divisions worked together as the collective kingpins of the kingdom's crime. Due to the size of their organization, their full extent was veiled in secrecy. However, there was a clear sign of the extent of the influence within the kingdom. That was the village before her eyes. They were openly growing contraband plants in villages. That alone was proof that the lord of the land was in cahoots with them. However, even an official inquiry would not bear fruit. Even if the royal household began an investigation, or took legal action, actually bringing the nobles in question to justice was very difficult. The lord of the land would certainly say, I didn't know these plants were the raw materials for drugs, or he would simply dump the problem on the villagers and say it was their idea. There were limits to the legal action that could be taken, and even if one wished to stop the flow of drugs, the process would be impeded by corrupt nobles aligned to the organization. The situation had deteriorated to the point where those who stood on the right side of the law could no longer resolve it. Therefore, they were left with the last resort of using violence and burning the fields down. Her frank opinion was that burning these drugs was only treating the symptoms and not the disease. The illegal organization eating away at the heart of the kingdom was too powerful, and their political backing was too strong. We're just buying time, if we can't turn things around, then all these efforts will be for naught. Part 2 The rain fell. The cacophony of the falling droplets rang in the ears. The streets of the royal capital had not been designed with drainage in mind, particularly the small alleys. In the end, the entire alley became a miniature lake. Splashes of water flew up as raindrops fell upon the water's surface. The wind blew ripples through said splashes, and the scent of water was heavy in the air, making the royal capital feel as though it were submerged underwater. There was a boy in this world that had been dyed gray by the splashing of water. He lived in a rundown hovel. No, using the word hovel would be giving the location underserved praise. That building was supported by narrow beams as wide around as a man's forearm. A tatty piece of cloth substituted for a roof, and the edges which draped down served as walls. 
A boy of six lived in these conditions, which were little different from an open-air restaurant. He was curled up in a corner like a casually discarded piece of rubbish, lying on a thin cloth where he laid his head. When one thought about it, the wood supports and the tatty cloth that served as both roof and walls were most likely the fruit of this boy's hard work, like a child building a secret base. The sole merit of this house that was unworthy of the name was that he was not directly soaked by the rain. The endless deluge made the temperature sink like a stone, shrouding the boy in shiver-inducing cold. The condensation from his short, infrequent breaths were the only sign that he was alive, and as the weather stole their heat, they vanished into the air. The boy had been soaked by the frigid rain long before entering his home, and he was rapidly losing body heat. He had no way to stop his shivering. However, this bone-chilling cold soothed the bruises which covered his body. That was the only solace for him amidst these horrific conditions. The boy remained curled up on the ground as he looked out at the abandoned alley, at the world. The only things he could hear were the sound of the rain and his own breathing. There was nothing else in the absence of those sounds, which made him think he was the only person left in the world. The boy was young, but he understood that he was going to die. He was not afraid of it, because he was young, and did not fully understand the concept of death. In addition, he did not feel that there was any particular reason to continue living. He had been clinging to life all this time, because he was afraid of pain, and fled it. If he could die, right then and there, without feeling any pain, only the chill of the wind and the hunger gnawing at his belly, then death was hardly a bad thing. He slowly lost the feeling in his rain-soaked body, and his mind began to fade into a blur. He should have found a place to hide from the rain before it fell, but he had run afoul of several thugs and received a vicious beating. It was good enough that he had managed to return here. This was the sole morsel of joy he clung to. Did that mean that everything else was suffering? It was quite common for him to go two days without eating, so that was hardly misfortune. He had neither parents nor anyone to take care of him, and that was how it had always been, so that did not qualify as misery. His tattered clothes and their repulsive stench were a fact of life for him, so that was not a hardship for him. Eating rotten food and drinking dirty water to fill his belly was the only way of life he knew, so it did not count as suffering. But then, his hovel was sometimes taken by others, or destroyed by those who took pleasure in wrecking it, and he was also beaten up by drunken men so his entire body ached. Was that suffering, then? No, it was not. The boy suffered, yet he was blind to his own suffering. However, all this would soon be over. The misery of which he was blissfully ignorant would end here. Death came without distinction to the fortunate and the unfortunate alike. Yes, death was absolute. He closed his eyes. His body had long since stopped feeling the cold, and now he lacked even the strength to open his eyes. He could hear his own faint heartbeat in the darkness. The sound of the rain blended with it, but then he heard something strange intrude into this world of his. A voice drowned out the sound of the rain. Amidst the fleeting remnants of his consciousness, the boy forced open his eyes, drawn by that curiosity unique to children. It entered the narrow field of his vision. The boy's rapidly closing eyes widened. It was beautiful. For a moment, he had no idea what it was. The best description for it would be gem-like, or glittering like gold. Of course, someone like him who ate discarded, half-rotten food to survive the days could not think of such things. Yes. There was only one thing in his mind. Like the sun, that was the most distant, unattainable thing he could imagine. That word appeared in his mind. The rain had dyed the world gray. The sky was filled with thick, black clouds. Perhaps the sun felt that nobody would notice, and so it had taken a walk and appeared before him. A thought like that ran through his mind. It reached out a hand to stroke his face. And so, the boy was originally not a human being. Nobody had treated the boy as a human being. But on this day, he became a human being. Diamond suit, diamond suit, diamond suit, third day of the lower fire, ninth, month, for fifteen this was the royal capital of the Riestais kingdoms. The fortress Arolant stood at its heart, 
Its grounds encircled by 1 foot 400 inches meters of curtain walls, with 20 huge towers spaced along its length. This room was located within one of those 20 towers. The lanterns were out in this none too spacious room, and there was a bed in there. A young man, somewhere between boyhood and adolescence, lay on the bed. His blonde hair was cropped very short, and his skin was tanned and appeared healthy. Climb. He possessed only a name, but no surname. He was a soldier who had been permitted to defend the lady, with the title of golden and honor, which had earned him the envy of many. He rose early, always before the sun rose. When he realized his consciousness had emerged from a faraway world of darkness, his mind cleared up immediately, and his body was almost fully operational. Klein was proud of his ability to sleep and rise quickly. His eyes opened wide, and an iron will burned within them. He peeled away the thick talc heat covering his body. It was summer, but the nights were cold when one was surrounded by stone, and Klein sat up on his bed. He touched his fingertips to the corner of his eyes. They came away wet. That dream again, huh? Klein wiped his tears away with his sleeves. The heavy rain of two or three days ago must have made him recall that memory of his youth. He was not crying out of heartbreak. How many people could one meet in a lifetime who deserved respect? How many worthy masters could one serve, the kind for whom one would gladly throw one's life away? On that day, when Clime had the good fortune of encountering a certain lady, he had decided to give his life for her at any time. The tears he shed came from joy. He wept out of gratitude for the miracle that encounter had brought. Klein's youthful face was filled with a steady determination, as he rose to his feet. There was no illumination here. In this lightless world, Klein spoke, in a voice that was hoarse from overtraining, lights on. The lamp on the ceiling shed white illumination in response to Klein's command word, lighting up the room's interior. This was a magic item enchanted with the, continual light, spell. While items like these could be bought on the market, they were not cheap and Climb only possessed one due to his unique position. Stone towers like these had poor ventilation, and burning things for illumination was not safe. Therefore, almost every room here was furnished with magical illumination, despite the steep initial expense. The white light revealed that the floors and walls were also made of stone. Several thin carpets were laid on the ground to lessen the cold hardness of the stone. In addition, there was a crudely made wooden bed, and a slightly larger clothes cabinet that seemed big enough to store his war gear. There was a desk with drawers, and then a wooden chair with a thin cushion on its seat. An outsider might consider this austere, but it was more than he deserved, in his opinion. Regular soldiers would not be allocated individual rooms. They would share double bunks and live in groups. The only other furniture they were assigned besides their beds was a locked wooden chest for storing personal items. He then glanced at the pure white suit of full plate armor in the corner of the room. It was so lustrous that it seemed to shine by itself. A standard soldier would never be issued such an exquisitely made suit of armor. Naturally, Klein had not earned such special treatment through his own merits. This was a gift from the liege to whom Klein owed his loyalty. Thus, it was unavoidable that others would resent him. He opened the dressing cabinet and took clothes from within. Then he dressed himself as he watched his image in the cabinet's mirror. First, he put on an old set of clothes. They smelled of metal, no matter how many times he washed them. Then he slipped a chain shirt over it. Normally, he would have donned his armor on top of that, but there was no need to be so formal right now. In its place, he wore a many-pocketed vest and a pair of pants, and then he was dressed. He held a bucket with a cloth in it. After that, he studied the mirror once more, inspecting himself for anything out of place or any oddities in his personal bearing. Any mistakes Clime made would be fodder for attacks launched against the Golden Princess whom he served. Therefore, he had to be extra careful. He did not live in this place to cause trouble to his mistress. He was permitted to live here in order for himself to dedicate everything he had to her. Clime closed his eyes before the mirror and imagined his mistress' face. She was the golden princess, Renner Thierre Chardillon Ralvez Elf. 
As expected of her highborn bloodline, she was surrounded in a sacrosanct aura, like a goddess descending upon the earth. She seemed to glow with compassion, and her mind produced many wise plans and policies. She was a noble among nobles, a princess among princesses. She was the perfect woman. Her golden brilliance, like an immaculate gemstone, could not be marred in any way. If one were to use a ring for comparison, Renner would be like a huge, brilliant cut diamond. As for climb, he would be the setting which held the stone in place. Any shortcoming in the setting diminished the value of the ring, so he could not do anything which might devalue her. Klein's chest burned uncontrollably as he thought about his mistress. Even the most pious supplicants to the gods could not compare to Klein's devotion. He examined himself for a while longer. After he was certain that he would not disgrace his mistress, Klein nodded in satisfaction and left the room. Part 3 Third Day of the Lower Fire, Ninth, Month for 35 his destination was a training hall which occupied an entire floor of the tower. Usually, this place would be abuzz with heat and activity from the soldiers here. However, it was early, so there was nobody here. The empty room was silent. The surroundings were made of stone, which made Klein's footsteps echo exceptionally loudly. The continual light, magical lamps lit the training hall brightly. Within the hall, there were pieces of armor tied to wooden pillars and dummies made of straw, to serve as archery targets. All manner of blunted weapons hung on the wall. Training should have been conducted outside, but there was a reason why it was done indoors. The Valencia Palace lay within Arolant Keep. Therefore, having soldiers train outside, where ambassadors and diplomatic parties could see them, would be boorish. Thus, several indoor training halls had been built within the towers. Granted, having proud and strong soldiers training in public could be used to impress one's counterparts during diplomatic negotiations, but the king did not like that sort of thing. To him, the kingdom was a nation that ought to show its graceful, elegant, and noble side to foreign guests. That said, some training still needed to be conducted outdoors. At times like those, the soldiers had to do so secretly in corners, or in fields outside the keep, or outside the capital entirely. Klein quietly entered the hall, as though wading through the cold air, and began warming up in a corner. After about half an hour of stretching, Klein's face was an uncommon shade of red. Sweat beaded on his forehead, and he exhaled puffs of smoke from his exertions. Klein wiped his sweat away, and then approached the arms racks. He picked up a heavy, blunted practice sword with a freshly blistered and calloused hand. Then he felt its weight, making sure it fit well in his grip. After that, he loaded his pockets with metal slabs and fastened them in place, lest the slabs fall out. After being weighed down by several metal slabs, his clothes now weighed as much as a suit of full-plate armor. Unenchanted full-plate was sturdy, but very heavy, and the joints also restricted one's range of movement. Therefore, Klein should have worn a set of full-plate to practice, for realism's sake. However, Klein did not want to wear a suit of full-plate armor just for regular practice. In addition, he knew that the white armor he had been awarded was not suitable for training. Therefore, he used the metal slabs as a substitute. He tightly gripped his sword, which was larger than a great sword, and adopted a high stance. Then Klein began to swing down, expelling his breath as he did. In the moment before the practice weapon struck the ground, he held it still, keeping it from actually striking the ground, and then brought it back up again as he inhaled. He slowly increased the speed of his swings, his eyes fixed on the air in front of him, his mind focused on his practice. He repeated these movements around three hundred times. Klein's face looked as though it could not possibly get any redder, and droplets of sweat flowed down his cheeks. His exhaled breath was hot, as though to vent the accumulated heat inside him. Klein had been through harsh training as a soldier, but the weight of a great sword was still quite heavy to him. Controlling the sword's speed to keep it from striking the ground after swinging it down required considerable arm strength. After the 500th repetition, Klein's arms began to cramp up and they felt like they were crying out in pain. The sweat flooded down his face in a deluge. Klein realized that he was at his limit. Even so, he did not intend to stop here. 
And then, don't you think it's time to take a break? A third party called out to him. Klein hurriedly turned around to see a male figure enter his field of vision. There was no better word to describe him than mighty. Indeed, he was a man who looked like a slab of forged steel. His stony face wrinkled, and the lines thus produced made him look older than his actual age. His bulging muscles proved that he was no ordinary person. There was no soldier in the kingdom who could not recognize him. Stronoff Sama. He was the kingdom's warrior captain, Gazef Stronoff. He was hailed as the mightiest man in the kingdom, and a warrior which nobody in the nearby nations could rival. You'll be overtraining if you keep it up. There's no point forcing yourself. Klein lowered his sword and looked at his arms as they trembled uncontrollably. You're right. I might have been overdoing it. Gazef rounded his shoulders at Klein's expressionless thanks. If you really understand, then don't make me keep nagging you about the same old thing. How many times is this, anyway? I'm very sorry. Gazef shrugged again as Klein bowed in apology. This back and forth had repeated itself between them countless times. Under normal circumstances, the two of them would leave things at that and focus on their own training. However, today was different. How about it, Klein? Shall we go a round or two? Klein's typically blank expression was thrown into disarray as he heard Gazef say those words. They had met here in the past, but they had never crossed blades. That was an unspoken rule between them. That was because it did them no good to practice together. Or rather, there were merits to doing so, but they were far outweighed by the demerits of doing so. The kingdom was now divided into the royal faction and the noble faction the latter of which was composed of a coalition of three of the nation's six great nobles. The power struggle between them left the kingdom's situation in a very precarious state. Some even felt that the only reason the country had not yet fallen apart was because of its yearly wars with the empire. Under these circumstances, the king's right-hand man, the warrior captain Gazef Stronoff, could not be defeated. For instance, if he were to be beaten, it would provide the opposing noble faction with ample material to criticize him with. As for Klein, suffering a grievous defeat might mean that the nobles would no longer allow him to defend Princess Renner's body. The fact that many nobles were disgusted that a nameless soldier like Klein was actually permitted to stay by her side, being that she was a world-class beauty who was also an unmarried princess. Due to the above-mentioned circumstances, neither party could afford to lose. More than that, they could not allow others to see their weaknesses, and give their enemies an opening to exploit. Both of them were of common birth, and so they had to be very careful in everything they did, in order not to cause problems for their masters. That being the case, why had Gazef decided to break this unspoken rule? Klein looked around. It could not be because there was nobody else around. The keep was a densely populated area. Surely someone would be watching from afar or spying on them from the shadows, but he could not think of any other reason. Klein had no idea if it was because of a good or a bad reason. He was confused and shocked, but he did not express it on his face. However, the person before Klein was the mightiest warrior in the kingdom. Though Klein's momentary consternation might have gone unnoticed by an average person, the person before him picked up on it and replied, recently, I've begun feeling that my skills are inadequate. Therefore, I wanted to train with someone who could last a while against me. You actually think that, Stronoff sama What exactly had happened to make Gazef, the kingdom's best warrior, doubt his own skills? Just then, Klein remembered that the unit Gazef led was short of several people. Klein had no kin, and so he had only heard the rumors in the Meshal. Apparently, the unit had been involved in a certain incident, and had lost several people. Indeed. If not for a certain compassionate magic caster, who aided me against the foe, I might not be standing here today, Klein could no longer maintain his iron mask when he heard this. Indeed, there was nobody who would not be surprised to hear those words. Unable to restrain his curiosity, he asked, what sort of person was that compassionate magic caster? He called himself Ains Olgown. By my reckoning, he ought to be on par with that monster of a mage from the Empire. 
Climb had never heard that name before. Climb worshipped heroes, and he had a secret passion for heroic sagas. His interest even crossed racial boundaries. In addition, he hungrily devoured any adventurous stories that he had come across in the neighboring countries. However, he had no memory of the person whom Gazef had mentioned. Of course, he might have been using an alias. That, ah, him. Klein tamped down his curiosity. How could I ask him excitedly about an incident where he lost his men? That'd be terribly rude. I shall remember the name of that great person, then, is it really all right for me to train with you? Well, it's hardly training, just crossing blades once or twice. Whether or not you learn anything from it is all up to you. After all, you're a first-rate warrior among the kingdom's soldiers. I feel more motivated when I train with you. This was high praise, but Climb could only take it as standard courtesy. It was not that Climb was very strong, but that the standards by which he was judged were too low. The average royal army soldier was little better than the average man, and far weaker than the imperial army's professional knights. Virtually none of them were famed for their martial skill throughout the surrounding nations like Gazef was. While Gazef's direct subordinates were excellent soldiers, they were still a notch beneath climb. Among the adventurers' rankings of copper, iron, silver, gold, platinum, mithril, orichalcum and adamantite, climb himself would be gold-ranked at best. He was not weak, but there were many others who were stronger than himself. Could a bit player like himself really motivate Gazef, who was adamantite ranked in adventure terms? Climb chased away those weak-minded thoughts of his. Having the kingdom's strongest man train with him was a rare opportunity. He would not regret it, even if Gazef ended up disappointed by the end of their session. Then, I pray you will exchange a few blows with me. Gazef smiled thinly and bowed. The two of them went for the weapons cabinet and picked out weapons suited for themselves. Gazef selected a bastard sword, while Climb selected a small shield and a broadsword. After that, Climb removed the metal slabs from his pockets. It would be terribly disrespectful to wear them while fighting someone stronger than himself. In addition, he had to give this battle his all, otherwise he would not be able to grow. His foe was the mightiest warrior in the kingdom. He had to focus all his energies and experience the power of mighty wall before him with all his strength. After Klein was ready, Gazef asked, 